good to be here tonight. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter number 1. 1 Peter chapter number 1. We're going to start reading in verse number 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust and your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Tonight we're going to look at a subject about our mind, preparing our minds really to serve God. And in verse number 13, it said, gird up the loins of your mind. That's kind of an odd phrase that maybe we're not really used to using in our vocabulary. But tonight we're going to dig into this and uh, just pray for the Lord's blessing. Dear Heavenly Father, God, as we come to you tonight, we thank you so much for the Word of God. We thank you so much for the ability, God, to have a mind that is clear, that can think, that can, uh, Lord, just be prepared to live for you and serve you. Lord, I pray tonight for our pastor that you'd be with him and help him as he preaches and does this revival. Lord, I pray your spirit will work in their church, and I pray, Spirit of God, you'd work in the church tonight that we're at. Speak to our hearts and help us to obey you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, when we think about our minds, our mind really is a gift from God. But at the same time, our mind is a place that we are constantly attacked by the devil. And the Bible describes the mind of a lost person in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, which is the image of God, should shine unto them. So we know the condition that we were in before we were saved. This morning we heard about Jesus Christ being the true light. He is the light that shines into our hearts and helps us to understand. And we know from the Bible that before you know Jesus, your mind is blinded. You don't know the truth. Now that's talking about spiritual things. Because we know that people in the world can understand earthly things. They can go to college and get a degree and work in a certain place. They know earthly things. They know that. But their mind does not understand spiritual things. When you're lost, you can read the Bible, and you're not going to understand the Bible because it's a spiritual book. And the Bible says that Satan is the one who blinds their minds, lest they believe in Jesus, and the light comes in and they understand. So as we get into this, as we read in verse 13, that first word says, wherefore. When you see a wherefore, you look up above that and kind of see what they're talking about to get just the full context of everything. So we're going to read some of the verses that precede this. Let's start in verse number 3. This is the, written by Peter. And in verse number 3, he says to them, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. As he's talking to these people, they, they, they're writing this letter to these believers they have a lively hope. These are Christians. These are ones that have placed their faith in Jesus. Now, when we use the word hope in our day and age, a lot of people use it different than the Bible uses it. You say, I hope I get a good grade on my test for those of you younger people who are in school. Or I hope, uh, you know, I hope, whatever, the weather's going to be nice this weekend and I'm going to have this. We use that saying, I really, hopefully this works out for me. But when the Bible uses the word hope, it is a strong confidence. Hope is, is it's our faith. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. And it's not something that's weak. It's not something that we say, Lord, one day I hope you're going to come back for me. Our hope says, Jesus, you are returning and we're going to live for you because we believe you. Our hope is an expectation that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. And our hope is in, it's in solid ground. It's in Christ Jesus. It's in the truth. Our hope is not just based on some myth, but it's based on the very words of God. 
And tonight, if, if you don't know Jesus, I, I tell you what, you can place your faith in Him. He's real. He, he is real. Just as real as I am standing here before you, Jesus Christ is real. He's in the heavens today. He died on a cross for our sins. We have a lively hope. Thank God we have a lively hope. Then he said in verse number 4, we have this hope, a lively hope, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. So right here he says that our hope is in Jesus Christ to an inheritance. Most of us understand what an inheritance is. It's when we think of it in earthly terms, it's something that we may get as our parents pass on to us. We have an inheritance. But one thing we know about the inheritance that we receive in this life, it is corruptible. It can be taken away. It can be lost. But what Peter said here is you have an inheritance with God that is incorruptible. It cannot decay. It cannot go away. It's immortal. It's forever. And then he said you have an undefiled. Undefiled means it's pure. It cannot be deformed. This is a, this is a pure inheritance that we have given from God. It doesn't fade away. And, the, and he said it's reserved in heaven for you. It's guarded and protected. But who protects that inheritance? Peter tells us in the next verse. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Ready to be revealed in the last time. Aren't you glad that God keeps our salvation? Aren't you glad that God keeps us? If, if it was up to me to keep my own salvation, I would have lost it a long time ago. There are people that, and, and they're deceived, and, they're, and, and they believe a lie, but there are people who, who teach that we can be saved by Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins. And He's perfect and He's holy. But then they teach that you can lose that salvation. That it can go away from you. But that's not what Peter said here, is it? He said it's incorruptible. It doesn't fade away. And who keeps it? It's kept by the power of God. It's not in our hands. It's in God's hands. What a wonderful salvation we have. And then look at number, uh, I'm sorry, verse number 6. He said, Wherein ye greatly rejoice. We're rejoicing in this salvation. We ought to rejoice in that salvation. But then he said, Though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. We have a wonderful salvation. But then Peter said this, If need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. It's interesting that Peter said, need be. And I think one of the reasons why Peter said that is because God puts things in our lives sometimes that try us. That we're in, we're in heaviness, but it's good for us. It's something that God is doing in our life, working in our life for good. Look in the next verse, number 7. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, Though it be tried with fire, it might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Right here, Peter said, the trial of your faith is more precious than, than gold. Most of the time, we don't look at our trials like they're precious. Precious is, is it's valuable, it's honorable. He said, it's more, the trying of your faith, Peter said, is more valuable than what money could buy. But a lot of times when we go through trials, we don't necessarily have that mindset. James had the same concept in the book of James chapter 1 and verse number 2. He said, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. Now, I don't know which one of you in this room could raise your hand and say, praise God, I'm glad I have this trial in my life right now. But you know what? You know what James said? It's good. It's good for you. And I think sometimes we miss things that God wants us to get out of life. Sometimes I think as God's people, we think that we're just automatically going to always make it through every kind of heartache and trial without ever being affected. But the truth of the matter is, hard times come in your life, and it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing for your faith to be tested. It's not a bad thing for God to put you through suffering. Even though at time it's like, okay, Lord, I'm ready to get out of this. I'm ready for this to be over. 
These Christians in this day and age knew what it was to suffer. They knew what it was to go through hard times and trials because the Romans, as their empire began to grow, they persecuted the Christians. They hated the Christians. And many Christians suffered at the hands of these cruel leaders. And Peter said to these people, take heart, don't be discouraged, don't give up. And he's going to encourage them and he's going to tell them how to live in that day and age. And I think the same is true for us today. That we need to learn how to really keep our minds focused on what is good. Trouble should never cause us to lose faith in God. They should cause our faith to be strengthened in our God. It should never turn us away from the Lord. Have you ever met somebody who's bitter about things that have happened in their life? Bitter at God? Bitter at what God has allowed in their life? God is good. He knows what's good for us. And though it may be a trying time for you now, there is goodness from God that is waiting on the other side. God wants to bless you. God wants to work in your life. Peter, he knew what it was to suffer. The Bible doesn't tell us how Peter died. And uh, historians, you know, they talk about it. And there, there's a couple different theories. But most people say that Peter was crucified under the hand of Nero. And most people believe that he was hung upside down because he didn't want to be hung like Jesus. He, he felt unworthy. But either way, he suffered. He was going to die for his faith. In fact, Jesus even told him that one day he would. In John chapter 21, when Jesus was talking to Peter after he had denied him, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. When you were young, you did what you wanted to do. You went where you wanted to go. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whithersoever thou wouldest not. This spake he signifying by what, by what death he should glorify God. So Jesus was telling Peter, this is how you're going to die. This is how you're going to glorify me. The Bible tells us that. So he knew. He knew suffering. Peter knew suffering. Look in... Uh, Look at verse number 8. So we're suffering, we're, we're, we're going through trials. And then he talked about the appearing of Jesus Christ. Verse number 8, whom, in ha whom having not seen, ye love. And whom though now ye see him not, yet, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Because we believe in Jesus. They, he told them, you haven't seen Jesus, but you believe him. You know he's true. Verse number 9, receiving the end of your faith. Even the salvation of your souls. One day our faith is going to end. One day everything that we're holding on to believing in is going to end. But it's going to end when we see Jesus. The salvation of your soul. The Bible says that salvation, one day it's going to be completed. It's going to be done. Right now, you're, and believe me, you're as saved as you're ever going to be. You're, not, you're, not, you're never going to see hell. You're never going to lose it. But the Bible makes it clear that God is working inside of us. In uh, Philippians 1.6, the Bible says, He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Meaning God is working. You're a work in progress right now. But one day, all of that's going to be done and over. And that's when we see Jesus. That's at His appearing. So, encouragement, even though you're going through hard times right now, even though things seem difficult... One day it's all going to be worth it. One day when we see Jesus Christ, everything that we struggled for in this life, living for Him, sacrificing our time, sacrificing our own desires to live for the will of God, it's going to be worth everything. It's going to be worth everything, every moment. But sometimes our minds don't always focus on those things. Sometimes our minds aren't always in tune with what God wants for our life. So here, I believe, is where Peter, in, in chapter number, thir uh, I'm sorry, verse number 13, he told them first off to gird up the loins of your mind. Now to gird up your loins, it is, uh, like I said, we don't really use that expression, but uh, back, back in the day when they wore these long flowing garments, these robes, these men that would wear them, and women even, but... It was mainly the men. They would, uh, they would pull up the, their long garments 
and tie them around their waist area and then put a belt and tighten that up. And they did that so that they could, whatever they were doing, if they were working for the day, if they were going to run a race, if you were going to go out to battle, you didn't want to trip over your robe. So you would guard it. You would guard it up. I'm glad we don't wear robes today. It's, it's a blessing. <laughs> I, don't know what it, I don't know what it means to gird my loins, but I put a belt on. Uh, some people, by the way, could wear a belt, and they should, but they need to learn how to use that. Amen. Oh, I don't think any of the guys in here need that, but if your pants fall below a certain point, you need a belt, guys. Sorry. It's true. You need a belt. So, anyway, we're, we're pulling up. So, think about this. It's not a physical thing, because he said, gird the loins of your mind. So, how do I gird the loins of my mind? I'm going to have to remove things that are going to cause me to trip up. Remove the distractions. Remove things from my mind that shouldn't be there. And as I said when I began, one of the greatest battlegrounds in our life is our mind, isn't it? Wouldn't you agree with that? One of the things that, we, that, that I struggle with more than anything is my thoughts in my head. Sometimes I have thoughts that aren't right. They're not true. They're not, they're not what they should be. And what do I do with those? If I leave those thoughts in my mind, if I just let those thoughts stay there, then I'm not going to be as effective for the Lord. And also, what we allow ourselves to see and hear and do, who we're around, all these things affect our mind. They affect it. So Peter's saying here, you're going to have to learn, you're going to have to prepare yourself for service in your mind. I think, about, uh, I think about Elijah. Whenever Elijah... Elijah was a great man of God. And he, he was just... He was, a, he was a tough man. And he, he stood on Mount Carmel against the prophets of Baal. And you remember when they uh, built their altars. And he was going to say, you're, choose today who you're going to serve. Let's, if God's the real God, let's follow him. If Baal, follow Baal. So these prophets of Baal, they, they built their altar... They cried out to their false god for hours and hours and hours. They cut themselves. They did all these crazy things, and nothing happened. And then Elijah, he had them pour the buckets of water on the altar. Pouring water, pouring water during this drought. They were probably thinking, this guy's crazy. He's using all my water. And then he cries out to God, and what happens? That fire pours out of heaven and burns that altar. But right after that, Right after that, Jezebel, the lovely, amazing Jezebel, she's gonna, she, she wants to kill Elijah. And he knows it. So what does he do? Does he say, bless God, he just came through for me, I'm not afraid of you. No, he was afraid, wasn't he? He ran. He ran. And I don't, you know, I don't, I don't stand up here and say, Elijah, what a whore. No, <laughs> I probably would have had the same response. Because we're all of like... Like minds, we have like passions, desires, fears. So Elijah's running, and God's trying to get a hold of Elijah and say, What are you doing, Elijah? Why are you here? And so he feeds him and gives him water. And... But anyway, he has a conversation with, with Elijah. And one thing that Elijah tells the Lord in 1 Kings chapter 19, he says, I, even I only, am left. I'm the only one. And by that, he meant, I'm the only prophet that's standing for you. There's nobody else. Was he right? No. He wasn't right. In fact, God's going to let him know. And uh, he lets him know in verse 18, Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed to Baal. He said, Elijah, you're wrong. You're not the only one left. But Elijah got to a place, and it happened pr fairly quick, where he was watching God do these miracles, and then he's running in fear for his life. And one of the reasons why he did is because he felt like he was the only one left. He told God that. Now sometimes in our minds, we feel like we're the only ones standing. We feel like we're the only ones going through these struggles. We feel sometimes like God doesn't care. Maybe we feel like God is not helping, He's not seeing our struggles, and we just can't make it anymore. Elijah probably felt like, I've been standing for you, Lord, I've done all these wonderful things, 
but I can't do it now. I got to run. I'm out of here. That's the devil. The devil is going to trip you up. He's going to cause you to, to, to believe this way and think this way. And that's what he wants to do. So Peter here, I believe, through the inspiration of God, tells us, get your mind prepared. Because it's going to be a battle. And if we're not preparing our minds, I, I think one of the problems with, with people today is they're just kind of lazy in their Christian life. They're lazy. Because I can just exist. I can wake up every morning. I can live an okay life. I can do okay, not really. But if I really want to be used of God, it's going to take more than just me waking up in the morning. And even more than just me spending 20 minutes reading the Bible. I'm going to have to take my Christian life seriously. I'm going to have to take my mind, what goes into there, seriously and prepare it to serve God. And uh, the, the, the phrase, gird your loins, is used multiple times throughout the Bible. In Proverbs 31, it talks about that virtuous woman. And it says, she girdeth her loins with strength. It's like she's putting on strength. In Job 38, God told Job, he said, Gird up thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. That's when God said, Job, you have all these things you want to talk about? All right, gird up your loins like a man. Come talk to me. In 1 Kings chapter 18, uh, the Bible says the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he gird up his loins. He actually, I think, would physically have done it there and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel because he girded up his loins because he's going to run in front of the chariot. God allowed him to do that. So he had to run pretty quick. Guys, you think you're quick at this basketball? Imagine Elijah running before a chariot. <laughs> he's faster than a horse. You ought to pray sometimes. Say, God, can you allow me to run like Elijah? <laughs> Maybe he'll grant that to you. Um, and then in, in Exodus chapter 12, when the Passover was going to happen, Moses told them, he said, when you eat the Passover, he said, eat it with your loins girded and shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand. He said, be ready to go. So it's used multiple times in the Bible so they, they wouldn't be restricted in their movements. And uh, hold, your, hold your hand right here and turn with me to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter number 12 and verse number 35. It says, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And ye yourselves liken to men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding. That when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. This right here is talking about being ready and prepared. For when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, being ready, being prepared. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, if you're saved, you're, you're, you're leaving this, this earth. You're leaving whether or not uh, you're living right or not. You're leaving because the Lord has saved you. But the Bible says there's a special blessing to those who are watching and waiting and ready and prepared. Don't you want to be ready? Amen. You know, thank God He saved us in spite of, of who we are. But I tell you what, when Jesus comes back, I don't want to be living for myself. I don't, I don't want to be living in, in the world. I don't want to be living for my own lust and my own desires. What a shame it would be for Christ to return and us not to even be ready for Him, living for Him, serving Him, loving Him. I think sometimes we live like it's just never going to happen. We, we let it leave our mind and we're so distracted by so many other things. In, uh, in, in Ezra chapter number 7, the Bible talks about Ezra and it says... For he had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach it in Israel. Ezra prepared his heart to seek God. Are you preparing your heart to seek after God? When you come to church, is your mind on God? Or is it on, what am I going to do when I get out of here? What am I going to eat? Is your mind on everything else or is it focused on the Lord? 
Do we prepare our hearts to receive from God what he has for us? Or are we just kind of, if God speaks, he speaks. I think sometimes people just live, if God speaks to me, he speaks to me. Good, he's going to speak to me. But Ezra prepared his heart. Ezra got it ready and said, God, I want what you have. I want to receive it. Do we have our hearts and our minds prepared to receive what God has for us tonight? I hope so. So first off, he said, gird up the loins of your mind. And then he said, be sober. That word is a common word that is used in our language today. And most people think of it with uh, you know, reference to drugs or alcohol. Be sober as far as avoid those things. And that would uh, definitely have its place here. But it's more than that. It's more than just avoiding alcohol and drugs. Um, Webster's Dictionary, that word is defined by temperance or moderation, seriousness. If you look in Strong's under that word, it's temperate. It's dispassionate, circumspect. And temperance, that's, that's keeping our, ourselves under control. It's, it's having self-control is what temperance is. What is one of the fruits of the Spirit? It's temperance, isn't it? We need God's help in this area of our life, for sure. But we need to learn how to control ourselves. And dispassionate, that means that we're not driven by our passions, by our own feelings, by our own thoughts. I don't know if it's now more than ever, because I don't know how people lived back a long time ago, but... It seems to be becoming more and more popular to live how you feel. Whatever makes you happy. Whatever, whatever you want, whatever satisfies you is how you should live. The Bible doesn't teach that. In fact, right here, Peter said that we need to be holy because God is holy. We don't just live by what we want and what we feel. We live because... But according to God's word, because he's a holy God, he expects us to be holy. And that's for his children, by the way. This isn't for a lost person. For his children, God expects and demands holiness out of us. And one of the ways that we can do that is by being sober-minded Christians. Whenever Peter was with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus was in agony. Jesus was about to take upon himself the sins of the entire world. And he was pouring out his spirit to God. And he was crying out to God. And he wanted his, his, some of his disciples, he brought them further in the garden with him. That was Peter, James, and John. And, you know, I, I can't, once again, I don't read these stories and criticize these people. Because, let me say this, I've been in prayer meetings. And I'm not going to say I've never dozed off in a prayer meeting. <laughs> we used to have them every Saturday night, and I could call some of these guys out. I could hear them snoring. So I wasn't the only one. <laughs> but they got to pray, and, and you, know, you know, your eyes get heavy, you get tired. But, but Jesus, and, and, and I got to think here, I mean, to think about how Jesus felt. I, I can't even imagine. We can't even imagine the experience that Christ took when he took our sins upon him. I know we can read the Bible sometimes and read the account of Jesus and we've heard it so many times and maybe we just kind of read over it uh, flippantly and just think, okay, Christ died for my sins. But the torture that was going on inside of him, that was going to happen to him. He prayed to, to God, God, if there's any way, any other way I can do this, please let me, let me pass this cup away. I don't want it, but I'm willing to do it. There was humanity inside of Jesus Christ. Yes, He is God. Yes, He's perfect. Yes, He completed the work on the cross. But that doesn't mean that there wasn't an inner struggle inside of Him. By the way, that's why we look to Jesus. Why we look to Jesus? Because He denied His own feelings for the will of God. He denied what, what was going against Him in His own mind, saying, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go here. This is going to be horrible and agonizing. But he, he thought about all those who have put their faith in him and those that would in the future. And he said, I love you and I'm going to die for you. What a wonderful God we have. I kind of got off track there. But Peter and the disciples, they fell asleep. 
And when Jesus was talking to him, he, he told him, he said, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And they fell asleep multiple times. And then it was just, Jesus said, all right, the time, time's over. Let's go. I'm going to the cross now. I think Peter learned a lesson here. And, you know, if we could talk to Peter today and ask him about lessons in his life, I, I would imagine this would be one of those lessons in his life that he learned the hard way. But Jesus said, you need to watch and pray. Be sober-minded. And here we see Peter when he writes this letter. Be sober-minded. You're in uh, 1 Peter, hopefully still. Turn to chapter number 4. Turn to chapter 4. And look at verse number 7. Peter said, But the end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Once again, I think that's learning that lesson from Jesus. Be sober and watch unto prayer. Now the end of all things is at hand. Peter believed the end of all things was at hand in his day. And let me tell you, we're closer than ever before. The end of all things is at hand. So with that in mind, what did Peter say we need to do? Let's take a vacation, right? Christ is coming back. Let's just relax, take it easy. No, he said, be sober and watch into prayer. Now more than ever, it's time to be sober-minded. Now more than ever, it's time to pray. Now more than ever, it's to try to do everything we can for Jesus Christ. Because he's coming back. And uh, chapter number 5 of 1 Peter, in verse number 8, once again he says this word, Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. The devil, he loves to cause turmoil. But Peter said that's, that's okay. You know what? The devil, he might, be, he might be moving. He's afflicting people. And there's people all across the world who have faith in Jesus Christ who are suffering. Be sober-minded. Be vigilant. We need to take our Christian life seriously. We need to take our walk with God seriously. And I would say now more than ever, it's time to wake up. Now more than ever, it's time to watch. More than ever, it's time to be alert. More than ever, it's time to pray. We need God. We need his help. And then he said, he not only said to gird up the loins of your mind and be sober, but he said this, hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then he told them, hope to the end. We, don't, we, don't, we ought to never lose hope in God. Things are confusing in our world today. And things are difficult but guess what we have hope our hope is not resting in who the next president's going to be our hope is not resting in what's going to happen with the virus our hope is not resting in any of that my hope is in Jesus Christ Amen. and he's going to come back one day and yeah I don't think we should be foolish about anything but I tell you what, more, don't, don't let your mind get to a place where you feel so discouraged about what's going on in the world around you. Be, be alert, be aware, understand what's going on. But I'll tell you what, God already told us how it's all going to end, didn't he? he may not, I, I may not know every detail of what's going to happen here in America, but I know when the end happens, Jesus Christ is coming back. And I know I'm going to be with him. I know one day I'm going to reign with him. I know he's going to have a perfect kingdom. I know one day the devil, he's going to be gone. He's going to get rid of him forever. We have hope. Peter said, hope to the end. He told this to people that knew what it was to suffer. And when they were going through suffering, you know what he said? Hope to the end. You know what I tell you tonight? Those of you who know Jesus as your Savior, hope to the end. Don't stop. Don't quit. Jesus Christ is coming back for us. 
He said, hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation means the appearing. When Jesus appears. There is grace that, that is going to be brought to us at the appearing of Jesus Christ. It's by God's grace that we're saved today. It's by gr God's grace that we make it through every trial in this life. But the Bible says that there is a grace that is going to come upon us when the Lord Jesus Christ appears. And I think that's the greatest grace we're going to have because he's going to take us with him. We're going to forever be with the Lord. We're going to get a new body. We're going to leave behind this, this, this sinful man. What a blessing. The Lord wants us to live for Him. We read when we started off about be holy for I am holy. As obedient children, we should be obedient children. We ought to be living for God. But I think the starting point of all this is our hearts and our minds. Are we preparing ourselves? Are we taking these things seriously in our lives? I don't want to be a lazy Christian. I don't want to be somebody who doesn't take God's word seriously. And I had to ask tonight, are there, is, is there any of you in here tonight who do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Because as we've talked about and said, Jesus is coming back one day. And when he comes, are you ready? And I'm not talking are you ready as far as are you serving? Do you know Christ that you're going to leave this life and go with him? Chances are there's some in this room tonight that you don't know Jesus Christ. You don't know Him as your Savior. You, you've never experienced the life-changing salvation that God brings. And I want to tell you tonight that this is the time. Don't put it off. Don't wait. There's so many reasons in our mind that we put things off. Sometimes I get distracted and I start doing other things and I put things off and forget about them and Come back days later and I forgot all about it. But one thing that you don't want to put off and forget about is knowing Jesus Christ. If he's speaking to your heart, you need him tonight. You need him. And I don't, I don't care if you've been in this church for 20 years, for 10 years, for 5, whatever. I don't care if your parents grew up in this church. You have to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You do. The Bible describes people who are lost in Ephesians chapter 2. And it says, having no hope and without God in the world. That's a lost person. They have no hope. No hope. But guess what? There's hope. And it's in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ can give you hope. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Do you know Jesus? Not are you a member of a church? Do you know Jesus? Not have you lived good enough? Do you know Jesus tonight? I can't imagine one day standing before the Lord at the great white throne judgment where there is no more hope for you. That's, that's the final judgment for those who have never received the Lord. Can you imagine standing before God Almighty and Him telling you you're going to spend forever in the lake of fire? It's serious. It's more serious than, and, and I know, okay, by the way, congratulations to the guys for winning this tournament, but more serious than winning a first place trophy. More serious than having the house of your dreams. More serious than getting the career you've always wanted to get is knowing Jesus Christ. And one day it's going to be too late. And there are so many people in this world, they've heard this message, they've heard this message, and they push it off. And, they're, and, they're going to, and so many people have left this life. They know tonight how serious it was. People who have died without Jesus, they know tonight how serious it was. But some of you in this room, you don't know how serious it is. Don't wait until it's too late. But thank God for the hope that he's given to us, right? 
So I encourage you, church, I encourage you believers tonight, hope to the end. Keep, keep trusting in God for everything. No matter how bad it gets out there, we have hope. We have a good God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you tonight. And God, I personally thank you for your salvation. Lord, it is so good. And God, I know one day I'm going to see you. I know that. I'm convinced in my mind. I'm convinced in my heart. Lord, my faith is in you. You're coming back. I pray for this church today. Lord, you know the hearts and minds of every one of these believers. Help those, Lord, who are struggling in their Christian lives, who are not taking things seriously. That, Lord, they, in their minds, they would settle it tonight. God, I'm going to be ready to serve you. I pray for those who are struggling with trials and troubles, that they would realize how good you are, and they would hope to the end, Lord. But I pray tonight for those who don't know you, God. I pray tonight your Holy Spirit would get a hold of their heart and work in them. Show them their need for salvation, Lord. Draw them to your side. In Jesus' name.